In the summer of 1776, something happened that changed the world forever. A small group of men stood up in Philadelphia and signed their names to a document that branded them as traitors to the British crown. Later, in a letter to John Adams, Pennsylvania's Benjamin Rush remembered the solemnness of the day's proceedings. Do you recollect the pensive and awful silence which pervaded the house when we were called up one after another to the table of the President of Congress to subscribe what was believed by many at the time to be our own death warrants? Why were these men willing to risk their lives? What did they want? They wanted to be free. They wanted liberty for themselves and for all the English subjects living in 13 British colonies in North America. And for the sake of creating a new kind of nation, they were willing to stake all on a dangerous war, a revolution. The fight for America's independence was sparked 16 years earlier by the rise to the British monarchy of King George III. In earlier years, Americans had been proud to be part of the British Empire, and their ideas of freedom were shared by many in England. But under George III, Britain was becoming more and more oppressive. Part of the idea of freedom which flourished in both Britain and the colonies was that freedom meant self-government, that you had a voice in the government that ruled over you. Now, obviously, not everybody did. Women didn't, slaves didn't. But increasingly, Americans felt that they were being ruled over from Britain by Parliament, by the king, without any voice. And as Parliament began to lay taxes on the colonies in the 1760s and 1770s, more and more Americans claimed that this was an attempt to take away their liberty, their right of self-government. No taxation without representation. They used the term slavery. The British were trying to enslave them. That didn't mean literally making them into slaves. It meant taking away their political liberty. If you didn't have political freedom, you were, in a sense, enslaved. In 1770, British troops stationed in Boston fired into a crowd of hecklers, killing five Americans. Patriot leaders called it the Boston Massacre, and it led to new levels of colonial resistance. In the House of Lords, William Pitt issued an ultimatum. I maintain that the Parliament has the right to restrain America. Our power over the colonies is sovereign and supreme. This is the mother country. They are the children. They must obey. To teach the rebellious colonists a lesson, Britain sent thousands of troops to America and imposed a new tax on tea. Enraged by the tax, colonists began thinking seriously for the first time about breaking away from England. And in Boston, a fiery patriot helped spark them into action. He was Samuel Adams. The duty imposed by Parliament upon tea is a tax on Americans without their consent. It is the duty of every American to oppose this attempt. In 1773, Sam Adams organized a group called the Sons of Liberty to take action against the tea tax. George Hughes was among those who disguised himself as a Mohawk Indian. Having painted my face and hands with coal dust in the shop of a blacksmith, I repaired to Griffin's Wharf where the ships lay that contained the tea. 
We then were ordered by our commander to open the hatches and take out all the chests of tea, throw them overboard. We immediately proceeded to execute his orders, first cutting and splitting the chest with our tomahawks so as to thoroughly expose the tea to the effects of the water. The Boston Tea Party was not just a symbolic gesture. 90,000 pounds of tea were destroyed. In response, an outraged British parliament closed down the Massachusetts legislature and shut the port of Boston, throwing half the citizens out of work. Sam Adams led the resistance. Now is the time when all should be united in opposition to this violation of the liberties of all. Courage then, my countrymen. Our contest is not only whether we ourselves shall be free, but whether there shall be left to mankind an asylum on earth for civil and religious liberty. Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies, for ample ways of green. Despite the courage of men like Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty, it was frightening to think of war. England was a great power and was now in military control of the city of Boston. The colonies were scattered and had little military experience. Prepared for the worst, New Englanders began to stockpile cannonballs and gunpowder in the small town of Concord, about 20 miles northwest of Boston. Paul Revere was a local silversmith. In the winter of 1775, I was one of upwards of 30, chiefly mechanics, who formed ourselves into a committee for the purpose of watching the movements of the British soldiers. We frequently took turns patrolling the streets all night. In April, Revere learned that the British had decided to march on Concord. He sent a spy into the British camp in Boston, instructing him to send a signal as soon as the British troops began moving. I said that if the British went out by water, we should show two lanterns in the North Church steeple, and if by land, one as a signal. On the night of April 18th, 1775, Revere saw one lamp in the church belfry. Then a second light appeared. Now he knew. The British were taking the water route across the Charles River. Paul Revere jumped on his horse and rode hard all night, warning everyone in the countryside. The regulars are coming! The British regulars are coming! At Lexington and at nearby Concord, the American farmers were ready. They grabbed their guns. They were called Minutemen because they could fight on a minute's notice. The opening skirmish took place on the village common in Lexington. And then the British marched on to Concord. There, the Americans were waiting at the Old North Bridge. Captain John Parker called out orders to the Minutemen. Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. And then the British started firing on the Americans and the Minutemen fired back, and the battle had begun. On that April day in Lexington and Concord, twice as many British soldiers fell as Minutemen. It was the day the Revolutionary War really began. After Lexington and Concord, King George proclaimed that a general rebellion existed in the American colonies and that utmost endeavor should be made to suppress it. Now the colonists, who often didn't seem to have much in common, found they were all being threatened. It made them band together as never before. The Virginian, Patrick Henry, summed up the feelings of many. The distinctions between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, and New Englanders are no more. I am not a Virginian but an American. In Philadelphia, at what was to become known as Independence Hall, Sam Adams' brilliant cousin, John Adams, helped organize a Congress of Delegates to discuss the crisis. There is in the Congress a collection of the greatest men upon this continent. From Pennsylvania came the political leader and world-renowned scientist, Benjamin Franklin. From Rhode Island came Stephen Hopkins, who didn't let his palsy stop him. New York sent wealthy Philip Livingston. 
North Carolina's Joseph Hughes was against separation from Great Britain. But all eyes were on the Virginia delegation when Colonel George Washington arrived. For my part, I shall not undertake to say where the line between Great Britain and the colonies should be drawn, but I am clearly of the opinion that one ought to be drawn. The crisis has arrived when we must assert our rights. One of the key articles of business at the Second Continental Congress was who would take over command of a new Continental Army. When John Adams stood up to nominate a general, almost everyone thought it would be his colleague from Massachusetts, John Hancock, who was serving as president of the Congress. But John Adams always did what he thought was best for the nation, not what would make him popular at home. There is but one man I have in mind for this important command. The gentleman I have in mind is from Virginia. John Hancock's face fell when he heard what Adams said, and George Washington, who realized he was the man from Virginia, rushed from the room. George Washington was unanimously elected commander-in-chief of the new army. But Washington knew he had an almost impossible job and feared he would be vilified if he lost to the British. Before he left for Boston to take up his command, he spoke to his old friend, Patrick Henry. Remember, Mr. Henry, what I now tell you. From the day I enter upon the command of the American armies, I date the ruin of my reputation. Washington headed straight for Boston, where a disorganized group of volunteers was preparing to fight the first major battle of the Revolution. 5,000 British troops were ready in Boston Harbor. They ridiculed their untrained opponents by singing a song that portrayed the American soldiers as backwards hicks who didn't know how to fight. They called them Yankee Doodles. But instead of being insulted, the colonists adopted the song as their anthem. With Washington still hundreds of miles away, the command of the American troops was given to William Prescott of Massachusetts. On the 16th of June in the evening, I received orders to march to Breed's Hill in Charleston with a party of about 1,000 men. We arrived and began the entrenchment around 12 midnight. By morning, the British were marching into the hills. Robert Steele was a young drummer boy who led the Americans into battle. I beat Yankee Doodle when we mustered for Bunker Hill that morning. The British marched with rather a slow step nearly up to our entrenchments, and the battle began. It is said that those present at the Battle of Bunker Hill never forgot the sounds, the smells, the ferocity of that day. In three hours of hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the Americans lost 441 men. More than 1,000 British soldiers were killed or wounded. The colonists lost Bunker Hill that June day, but they gained something even more important. They now realized that the British were strong, but not invincible. Samuel Adams urged Americans never again to look back. When I tread over the uncoffined bodies of my countrymen, neighbors, and friends, when I behold my country changed by Englishmen to a theater of blood and misery, heaven forgive me if I cannot detest submission to a people who have ceased to be human. Throughout the American colonies, a debate took place between those who wanted to remain loyal British subjects and those who wanted to break free. And then, at that very moment, an eloquent writer began to convert many of them to the cause of liberty. He was Thomas Paine, who had recently arrived from England to become an American. And he was one of the strongest proponents of separation. There is something absurd in supposing a continent to be perpetually governed by an island. Every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression. Freedom has been hunted around the globe. In January 1776, Paine wrote a pamphlet called Common Sense. In it, he proclaimed, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. 
When he said, in common sense, we have it in our power to begin the world over again, what he meant was an entirely new government and society could be created here. It wasn't just one little fragment of the British Empire breaking off and then replicating Great Britain over here in America. That the idea of American independence was to create something completely new, a government based on democracy, on self-government, and a society based on equality. Those were the ideals that Paine put forward. And to him and those who read him, that was the sort of basic meaning and promise of the American Revolution. In Philadelphia, John Adams was among those who read Paine. And it was he who convinced the delegates at the Second Continental Congress to have the courage to begin the world again. On July 2nd, 1776, Congress voted to declare independence. An elated John Adams wrote home to his wife, Abigail. Yesterday, the greatest question was decided whichever was debated in America. A resolution was passed without one dissenting colony that these united colonies are and of a right ought to be free and independent states. It is the will of heaven that the two countries should be sundered forever. If the delegates to Congress were going to take the dangerous risk of demanding their independence, they wanted to explain exactly why it was necessary to be free of English rule. So they asked Virginia's Thomas Jefferson to write a Declaration of American Freedom. Jefferson worked on the second floor of a brick house in Philadelphia. Sitting at a portable writing desk he himself had designed, he wrote and rewrote until he had it the way he wanted it. And then the delegates made a few changes, and it was done. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Well, the Declaration of Independence is really the founding document, in some ways, of American conceptions of liberty. It announces to the world that there is this movement for American independence, and it's based on universal ideals. All men are created equal. Everybody is entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It identifies the American Revolution with this universal set of values of the rights of all mankind. That's a very radical idea, especially at that time when many, many people did not enjoy those rights. When Jefferson wrote, all men are created equal, did he mean just men? Just white men? No one knows. Jefferson was a complicated man. He thought slavery was wrong, yet he himself owned slaves. But Thomas Jefferson's words were bigger than he was, and they would grow ever more inclusive with the passing of time. May the declaration be to the world what I believe it will be, the signal of arousing men to burst the chains of superstition and to assume the blessings and security of self-government. So finally, the day arrived, July 4th, 1776. The members of the Second Continental Congress were ready to formally adopt the Declaration of Independence. John Hancock of Massachusetts put his name down that day. He did it with a big, bold signature. 56 men would end up signing their names to the Declaration of Independence. All knew that if the colonial army was defeated by Britain, they would pay with their lives. On the day he signed to help break the tension, Benjamin Harrison of Virginia, a huge man, turned and spoke to skinny Elbridge Gary of Massachusetts. I will have a great advantage over you, Mr. Gary, when we are all hung for what we are now doing. From the size and weight of my body, I shall die in a few minutes. But from the lightness of your body, you will dance in the air an hour or two before you are dead. Copies of the Declaration were still warm from the printing press 
when they were stuffed into saddlebags and sent on their way to each of the 13 colonies. In the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with... On July 19th, the declaration arrived in Boston, and Tom Crafts, a house painter, stepped out on a small square balcony in front of the Massachusetts State House and read it aloud. That they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created... When he finished, a voice rang out, God save the American states. ...that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. John Adams's wife, Abigail, was part of the jubilant crowd. The bells rang, the cannon were discharged, and every face appeared joyful. After dinner, the king's arms were taken down from the state house, and every vestige of him burnt. America. Thus ends royal authority in this state, and all the people shall say, Amen. And crown thy good. Now, as Thomas Jefferson knew, there was no turning back. We can no longer say there is nothing new under the sun, for this whole chapter in the history of man is new. From sea to shore.